Welcome to Brain and Avat. We are delighted to be joined by Jeff Sebo, and we're going to be talking about his latest book, Saving Animals, Saving Ourselves. Jeff, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Yeah, sure. So imagine a thought experiment, which to prime you is very similar from the famous Peter Singer thought experiment and famine, affluence, and morality with a, a couple of important twists. So imagine that you have a house with a backyard and you decide to build a, a swimming pool in, in your backyard. And so you spend a while building the swimming pool in your backyard and start to build a fence, but the fence has some holes. And then one day you wake up, get ready to go to work. And then you notice out the window that a fawn, a young deer has walked through a hole in your fence and unfortunately fallen into the swimming pool and is drowning. And really you should have thought about that because you know that this family of deers walk through your backyard all the time. And that was actually part of why you were slowly, maybe a little bit too slowly building this fence. And, and so you should have anticipated that, that the deer would walk through the hole in the fence and, and would maybe fall into the pool and be in trouble. Now, the question is, do you have a moral responsibility, assuming you can do so safely and effectively? Do you have a moral responsibility to wade into your new swimming pool and save this fawn from drowning? And we can add the, the various costs and benefits that, that Singer adds in the original thought experiment. Maybe you spoil your work outfit, you ruin this outfit, you end up being a little bit late for a meeting and, and the meeting might not go as well as you hoped. And, and so you have to weigh those personal costs, ruining your outfit and being late for your meeting against the benefit of saving this deer from, from drowning. And I, I present this case because I think that you should save the, the fawn. And I think there are multiple avenues toward the conclusion that you should save the fawn. One of course is the traditional, more consequentialist avenue towards thinking that you should save the fawn, which is to note that you have the power to prevent something very bad from happening without sacrificing anything comparably significant. And so you should, but then you also have this other more non-consequentialist route toward the same conclusion, which is the recognition that you are complicit in this very bad thing because you knowingly and willingly built a hazard in your backyard without adequately protecting the animal from being harmed by it. And so, so you have a responsibility to save the deer from this perspective, not simply because a bad thing is happening, but because you in various ways caused it to happen and you have a responsibility to reduce and repair harms for which you are responsible or in which you are complicit when you can do so safely and effectively. So, so now we have a consequentialist and non-consequentialist case for intervention. And for various reasons that we can discuss later on in this conversation, I think that this has quite dramatic implications for our responsibilities to other animals in general. So I like the case. I like the adaptation of the case, partly because it raises this problem of the worth of animals uh, specifically. So I just wondered this, suppose you do have the responsibility on a consequentialist account to go and save the fawn and we just alter the case a little bit. So we alter the case so that you did install a fence that to your knowledge didn't have any holes in it, but it just so happens that a hole appeared the night before without your knowledge. You look out the window the next morning, you see exactly what you did in the original case. The, the, the fawn is, is, is dying, is drowning. You could save the fawn. It'll spoil your work shoes. Uh, now do you have the responsibility to save the fawn? Right. I think that you do <laughs> because I am a consequentialist and, and I think that you should reduce suffering when, when you can do so without sacrificing anything comparably significant, et cetera. Though I agree that this is a case that maybe drives a wedge between the consequentialist and the non-consequentialist case. If you construct the case in such a way that you really are not complicit, this was not a foreseeable consequence or an expected consequence of your behavior and so on and so forth, then, then perhaps the consequentialist case remains, you can reduce suffering, you should, but, but the non-consequentialist case is a little bit harder to make because you might not be as complicit in or responsible for the harm as, as you were in my original version. Now I want to push you further. So mm -hmm. you're saying that you're responsible for the, the fawn who's drowning in, in your backyard in your pool. Suppose you look out the other window and you see instead of a fawn drowning in your pool, there's a fawn drowning in your neighbor's pool. 
it'll require a little bit more effort to, to go and save that fawn. You'll have to jump the fence to your neighbor's yard, but you can save it too. And you must be committed to the view that, well, you need to save that fawn. And, and I'm going to say to you, but there's, there's pools all along your street and there could be a fawn in every one of them. Supposing they don't fall in simultaneously. Let's say they fall in one after the other every five minutes. And they really, it is possible for you to save one after the other. Mm -hmm. And it's not just your street, it's your whole suburb and, and it's, it's your entire country. I think that's the right analogy for, for animal suffering. And when, when I put it that way, you seem committed to the view that you should devote your whole life to saving all these animals. And I just don't find that plausible. Well, yeah, more, more than being the right analogy. I think that is the literal reality. <laughs> <laughs> that we that we are living in we we are gradually transforming the world into a human world not only by building houses and neighborhoods and swimming pools in our backyards and fences with holes in them but more generally by engaging in deforestation and development and building agricultural and transportation systems and and cities and then of course transforming the world even more through pandemics and climate change and and other effects of of human activity and this is systematically impacting and in many cases harming other animals in precisely this way and i agree with you to really protect every animal to really save every animal we would have to devote our entire lives to that task and we would still barely barely uh scratch the surface so, so I, I totally get that many people are going to find it implausible that we in fact should dedicate ourselves to protecting or saving as many animals as possible. And I think there are all kinds of caveats and qualifications in practice that we can get into. But in theory, I absolutely do think that the, the argument and the conclusion of the simple case do extend to, to the more complicated real world case. And once we start to consider all the caveats and qualifications, those might be reasons for being thoughtful and selective and strategic about how we go about protecting and saving animals, but they are not good reasons to not set that goal for ourselves. So I suppose Jason's additional thought experiments raise a couple of things. The one and is to, to take us away from the vivid Bambi example where everybody says, of course, you have to go and save Bambi and to say, well, let's, let's put ourselves in the real choice that you're asking us to make. The choice isn't about having wet shoes for a day. It's about dramatic sacrifices in terms of the quality of your life. That as you point out, there's going to be trade-offs between human development and animal well-being, And we then have to have some sort of sophisticated mechanism to determine how we do those trade-offs. The other thing that I think is going to make a difference is the nature of the animal that we give. So when it's Bambi, we think, well, of course we must do things to save Bambi. If it's an ugly mole rat that's fallen, fallen into the pool, people I think have a different feeling about that. When you think about threshers going through vegetable tracks to harvest wheat or whatever it is, or corn, and a whole bunch of rats are being killed along the way. I mean, the scale of the killing is dramatic, but a lot of people say, well, so what? Those animals don't matter. And so there's an interesting question, I think, about which animals matter, how do we determine that, and where do we balance the trade-offs against human well-being and human either luxury or need? Yeah, th those are really great and, and difficult questions. So, so before I answer that, I should briefly note that, that I do think that there are many opportunities to help or save animals that would be positive some that would be, be good for humans too. And, and a lot of the book is actually about that. The book is a story about how animals are part of global health and environmental threats because our treatment of animals in factory farming and deforestation and the wildlife trade not only kills trillions of animals per year directly, but then also increases the risk of pandemics and climate change and other global threats that then harm human and non-human animals all over again. And so as a first step, we have all these low hanging fruit opportunities to simply reduce or eliminate our harms against animals in these industries so that we, we harm them less directly and then contribute less to these threats that harm us and them all over again. So, so I do agree that there are conflicts and trade-offs between human and non-human interest in some cases, and, and that we do need to think about how to resolve those trade-offs in a thoughtful way. And I think it helps to start by acknowledging that we can go a really long way focusing on positive sum in interventions or, or reasonably positive sum interventions. Okay. So, so 
with that said, we can set that to the side now. How do we then determine which animals count and how much they count and, and how we can trade off human and non-human interests? So instead of trying to answer these questions, I do have my own answers, but instead of trying to answer the questions in the book, I mainly show how value-laden these issues are. And, and so just to illustrate that, obviously you might think that all and only sentient beings have moral status, or you might think all and only living beings have moral status and your views about these issues are going to be very different. If we focus on, on the view that all and only sentient beings have moral status, which is the, the view that I personally find the most plausible, then you need to get into to some really tricky questions like which animals are sentient which requires answering which animals are conscious, which requires solving the hard problem of consciousness and the problem of other minds. And I think we are not likely to, to solve those problems anytime soon. And so the, the way that I handle that issue is by treating it as, as an instance of risk and uncertainty. In general, when we, we, when we need to make decisions under risk and uncertainty, we have tools that we can use to do that, like expected value principles or precautionary principles. And so, if instead of asking which animals are definitely sentient and which animals are definitely not sentient, if instead of doing that, I look at behavioral and physiological and evolutionary evidence and assign probabilities to, to the sentience of different animals and then uh, assign amounts of happiness and suffering that they could be experiencing if they experienced any at all, then we can start to put together some estimates. So I might think that uh, all vertebrates are at least 80% likely to be sentient complex invertebrates like octopuses are at least like 60 to 70% likely to be sentient. Simpler invertebrates like insects are maybe 20 to 40% likely to be sentient. And then you can go from there. And even with insects, that would be really striking because even if insects are more likely than not to not feel anything at all, a 20 to 40% risk is a real risk. If, if I told you there was a, a 20 to 40% chance that drinking and driving, you would run someone over. <laughs> that would be a good enough reason not to drink and drive. You call an Uber and find a different way home. And similarly, if there is a 20 to 40% chance that the quadrillions of insects we kill every year with insecticides and the trillions we care kill every year in insect farming, if, if there is a 20 to 40% chance that they might be suffering, we should take that into account when deciding how to treat them. So, so I handle it that way as a matter of uh, probabilities and levels of impact given our limited information. Let's say we took that view seriously. So we said, okay, there's a 20% chance that insects can suffer. And so we've got a situation where you have these locust hordes that ravage farmers' crops. And we say, well, let's just do a count. So as you say, it's trillions of insects and we could, we could kill them and save the, save the vegetables, which are, as you say, merely living, so they don't count. And a whole bunch of farmers will starve to death, but is it going to be trillions of farmers? Maybe it's a couple of hundred thousand farmers. Surely we should just let the insects eat and let those farmers die. Maybe some of them will work out some other way to eat. Maybe they'll work out some work-life balance with the insects and they can cohabit, but we definitely shouldn't be using the, the insecticides. I mean, that seems like an insect holocaust. You know, think about how much potential suffering there is. Yeah, you, you, say, that, you say that in a way that, that suggests reductio ad absurdum. But I, I think we should take that possibility seriously. This is one of those areas where I think there are caveats and qualifications. But then the punchline is, is that I, I think we should take that possibility seriously. So, so the, the caveats and qualifications include things like, well, you have to consider not only the probability of sentience, but then also the level of welfare that each individual would, would experience if they had any at all, right? So, so there might be a 20% chance that an ant can feel pleasure and pain, but then they might feel much less pleasure and pain than, than a human does, if any at all. And you might use something like their neuron count and their lifespan as a proxy for how much they can experience, or you might complicate it in various ways. But in any case, in expectation, an individual ant will, will have much, a much lower capacity for welfare than an individual human, right? And then there are other caveats and qualifications too. For example, you have to figure out not only how much welfare they can have in expectation, but also whether their welfare is net positive or negative in expectation. Because if their welfare is net positive in expectation, then yes, killing them harms them and keeping them alive helps them. But if their welfare is net negative in expectation, then the reverse might be true. And, and then of course, depending on what moral theory you accept, that might get complicated further with considerations of rights and, and justice and so on. But there really is an open question about whether insect welfare 
is net positive or net negative because insects are our selected animals. They reproduce by having lots and lots and lots of babies and, and giving no parental attention to them. So the vast majority die so that a few can win the genetic lottery. And so it does seem more plausible with our selected invertebrates like insects that they could have neutral to net negative welfare, not guaranteed, but possible, right? In which case all the benefits and harms flip on their head. Obviously insecticides cause suffering, but, but if you can kill them painlessly, then things would be different. So those are just examples of how we really need to do our homework before we, we know what kinds of probabilities and utilities to assign to, to insect well-being or, or the well-being of other types of animals. Now, with all that said. I think we should take the possibility seriously that, that we should assign them much more weight in the aggregate than we currently do, and perhaps much more weight than we assign ourselves, at least eventually in, in the long run, once we build the kind of capacity we would need in order to, to really take care of them. I, I, I do think we should, we should extend much more consideration even to insects than we currently do. Okay. But now let's take this seriously. Suppose that a particular, um, species of insect has net negative utility in its life. You have a moral obligation to wipe out that insect to extinction. This is where it both gets into the broader empirical considerations and into the broader normative considerations. And so we can take it both from consequentialist and non-consequentialist perspectives. From a consequentialist perspective, many people do think that if, if wild animals, including, but not limited to insects have net negative welfare then we actually owe it to them to drive them to extinction, hopefully in a non-violent or, or relatively pain-free way. And then of course, many non-consequentialist animal rights advocates are opposed to that. Now, from a consequentialist perspective, I, I think we need to take that possibility seriously. When a lot of suffering is happening, we should reduce it. And if that means allowing fewer of certain types of beings to come into existence, then, then we should consider that. I mean, we all believe that with respect to factory farm animals, for example, however, a good indirect utilitarian or consequentialist needs to consider all sorts of other issues, including the value of rights and virtues and caring relationships. So, so from a good indirect, sophisticated consequentialist perspective, we have to note that building systems of rights and then respecting those rights in the long run often does more good for vulnerable populations than killing them whenever it seems expedient to do that and cultivating virtuous character traits, respect and compassion, similarly can do more good in the long run than, than killing vulnerable populations whenever it seems expedient to do that. So, so those sorts of indirect consequentialist considerations can sometimes be safeguards on an impulse to, to deal with suffering by killing the sufferers, as opposed to searching for other ways to reduce the suffering. Now, from a non-consequentialist perspective, of course, you have to weigh the value of reducing suffering, including suffering for which you are partially responsible, you have to weigh the value of reducing that suffering against the value of respecting wild animal autonomy and respecting the rights of wild animals and all sorts of other things. And so what I think we see here is a convergence between the consequentialist and non-consequentialist attitudes about our duties to wild animals. Consequentialists start out pro-intervention but then they moderate that when they consider the, the value of rights and virtues and so on. And non-consequentialists start out anti-intervention, but then they become a little more willing to intervene once they recognize their own complicity in the suffering. And then we, we achieve, if not consensus, then some kind of overlap on a, a moderately, cautiously pro-interventionist stance. So Mark's two objections points out that you're overly conservative with animal life. In other words, you're protecting too many animals like the locusts. And the objection I just gave was the opposite, is that your view might be overly eliminativist. So it might eliminate animals that we shouldn't eliminate or insect. There's another um, overly eliminativist objection that might be raised is that if you're drawing the line at value and rights at possible sentience, then we're going to you're going to have to hold the view that it wouldn't matter in and of itself. If I were to kill off all the plant life on the planet, it only matters in so far as it impacts sentient animals. So that might strike a lot of environmentalists as incorrect. They might say, well, if, if, if you go and poison this forest, 
it seems like you've done something wrong, even if I remove all the insects first and place them in a nicer forest and all the bird life first and place it in a nicer forest. It feels like when I destroy that forest, I've done something wrong. And you might even enhance the case and say, suppose I kill every living tree, every living plant, every blade of grass, and just replace it with another one in, in a few years time. And, and through the quirk of, of the hypothesis, no animals get harmed in this. Have I done anything wrong by killing off all of that life? I like my plants on my balcony, Jeff. They, 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 they nice, they, they nice plants. I used to live on a forest once upon a time and I liked that forest. It's, it feels to me like, like you might be overly eliminativist. So, so I can say a couple of things that I think are, are important in, in response to your question. One is the standards that sentientist response to, to this biocentric challenge, which is look, sure plants and species and ecosystems might not have intrinsic moral status. They might not morally matter for their own sakes, but who cares? They still morally matter a lot. They have a profound amount of aesthetic and cultural and religious and ecological and economic significance. We literally depend on them in order to exist and, and be happy and flourish in life. And so even if these are all forms of extrinsic or instrumental moral significance, they still are a, a lot of moral significance. And in practice, we should go about assigning an amount of weight to our impacts on, on plants and, and species and ecosystems. And, and who cares if technically that, that is all a matter of, of respecting their extrinsic and instrumental value. It still more than explains the attachment that we have to them in a satisfying way, all things considered. That would be the standard sentientist response, which I think is, is reasonable and, and broadly accept. But then I'll add to that, that I still think that we need to be thinking about these issues on a model of the ethics of risk and uncertainty, both with respect to empirical uncertainty and with respect to normative uncertainty. So with respect to empirical uncertainty, once again, to, to determine which beings are sentient requires determining which beings are conscious, which requires answering the hard problem of consciousness, the problem of other minds, which I think we are not yet in a position to do. And if you assign a non-zero to the idea that say panpsychism is true as a theory of consciousness, then you also ought to assign a non-zero credence to, to the possibility that plants are sentient and that certain ecological systems are sentient. So that would be one route, even from a sentientist view to at least assigning non-zero moral significance to, to plant. And then with respect to normative uncertainty, also, I think we, we should, we should keep an open mind about which theory of moral status is true. It, it, it seems plausible to me, highly plausible that all and only sentient beings are, are morally significant for their own sakes, but we have been wrong about this before. And, and our history is a history of, of always underestimating which beings matter and overestimating what it takes to matter. And, and so if, if we allow for the possibility that we are still on that trajectory of moral progress and moral circle expansion, then I should assign also a non-zero credence to the idea that something like biocentrism is true, even if it currently seems false to me. And so those are two different routes to in practice out of caution, extending some moral consideration to plants over and above their extrinsic and instrumental value. So I think one of the strategies that you use in the book is to take the view that we could entertain a variety of different moral positions. We don't necessarily know which one is the correct moral position. And I think that you can do something interesting, which is that you can provide arguments for those that don't think that animals have any intrinsic value. So in other words, you have the speciesist anthropocentrist who says only human beings matter. Animals are only valuable in so far as they're good for humanity. As you alluded earlier in our discussion, if we treat animals badly, if we treat the environment badly, it could have very negative consequences for, for humanity. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. So, so as I mentioned, our current industries like factory farming and deforestation, the wildlife trade kill trillions of animals a year directly, and then contribute to these broader health and environmental threats. So for example, factory farming is a leading consumer of land and water and energy and a leading producer of waste and pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. And 
for that matter, a leading consumer of antibiotics and producer of antibiotic resistant pathogens. And uh, similarly, deforestation uh, contributes to both pandemics and climate change, because when we reduce forested biodiversity, we increase the spread of diseases in wild animal populations. And then we encounter wild animals more and, and in, increase the spread of diseases from them to us. And then similarly, of course, with the, the wildlife trade, we also will, will interact more with wild animals and make them sick and make them spread diseases to themselves and then to us. That might be how COVID-19 started. We might not ever know for sure, but either way, that is how a pandemic could start. And, and deforestation like factory farming which contributes to deforestation, deforestation also contributes to climate change because trees are, are natural carbon sinks. They, they capture and, and store carbon dioxide. So when we cut them down, we release stored carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we make it harder for the planet to capture and store carbon dioxide in the future. So in all of these ways, when, when we kill animals in factory farming, deforestation, the wildlife trade, we, we consume land, we consume water, we consume antibiotics. And we contribute to these global health threats like pandemics and, and climate change. And when we recognize that, we recognize that one of the main ways to meet our own selfish <laughs> speciesist health and environmental goals. For example, the recent methane and deforestation goals made at COP26 in fall 2021. The, the best and in fact, only way to achieve those goals is to very significantly reduce, if not eliminate our, our exploitation and extermination of non-human animals in, in these ways. And of course, there are also deeper ways in which human and non-human fates are linked. Our moral character is shaped by our treatment of the most vulnerable among us. And so when we do, this is the old Kantian point. When we, when we harm and kill animals, we in various ways coarsen ourselves and become more likely to harm and kill each other. And then to justify that through dehumanization, comparing other humans to animals who are presumed to be lesser than. So in all of these ways, improving our treatment of animals will lead us to improve our treatment of, of humans too. Now, as I say in the book, I think we also ought to improve our treatment of animals for their own sakes and that there are further things to do in order to accomplish that goal, but we can get a long way just by recognizing our self-interested anthropocentric reasons for treating animals better. So Jason has a, an interesting tech, which he's been, uh, selling for a couple of years. He's a sci-fi writer, so you can sort of see how this would, would fit in with his philosophical inclinations. He's also a utilitarian. His view has been that the best thing for humanity to do for its own sake is to get off planet. But the problem with people is that they're very lazy. And if we don't get off planet, there's, there's the possibility that we'll get hit by an asteroid, that there'll be a pandemic that wipes us all out, that there'll be some cataclysmic events and humanity will cease to exist. So we've got to get off planet. And the best way to get us off planet is uh, to make things kind of unbearable on earth. And we have seen a little bit of this, which is that Elon Musk has said, well, I, I want to die on Mars. I don't want to live on a planet with COVID all over the show. And so Jason has taken the view that we should accelerate climate change. That would be the, the way to kind of motivate us off planet. And so uh, I wonder if you take the utilitarianism seriously and you, you take the empirical claim seriously that this would be the way to kind of ensure that humanity uh, survives, that maybe we should ratchet things up a little bit to have an accelerationist view, um, you know, for the sake of humanity going forward. And Jeff, it, it, it also fits very well with your view, which is that animals matter. I mean, you might take the view that in the short term, animals suffer as a result of climate change, but in the long term, you've got global greening, you've got ecosystems flourishing after humanity dies out. It, it seems like it's a, it's a win-win. Yeah. Humanity gets to survive among the stars and you, your animals get to flourish. Yeah. Yeah. So I think in general, we, we should, we should take accelerationist arguments more seriously than people sometimes do of, of all varieties. And, and I also agree with you as, as at the end of the day, a fellow utilitarian that we should fundamentally be in the business of maximizing happiness and minimizing suffering for all sentient beings from now until the end of time. And that if we have a relatively optimistic view about our prospects, that does mean leaving the planet and populating the cosmos with, with all sorts of happy sentient beings, either human or non-human, or for that matter, digital, which, which probably is the trajectory that, that we would be taking if we wanted to be efficient about it. So I agree with you actually about all of that. But I, I disagree with at least the characterization of, of your view that, that the best way to accomplish that goal 
is to accelerate the things that are making life on this planet hard for humans. I actually think that would be the wrong way and, and it would be counterproductive to accomplish this goal because the, the, the single biggest obstacle in the way of our leaving this planet and spreading happiness throughout the cosmos, the single biggest obstacle is the, the series of existential threats that our, our species is going to face over the next 500 to 1000 years while we try to like get our act together and grow out of our adolescence as a species. And that includes pandemics worse than climate, worse than COVID-19. It includes climate change, but then it also of course includes asteroids and comets and runaway artificial intelligence and all sorts of other things that, that could go very badly to say nothing of nuclear war, which many people are thinking about uh, suddenly again, right, right now in, in March 2022, to be clear <laughs> for future listeners. So, so those are all huge obstacles in the way of our getting our acts together and, and reaching the point where we actually can leave the planet in an effective and sustainable way. And climate change is a threat multiplier. So if climate change occurs in an especially severe way, it makes all of those other threats worse and harder to recover from and vice versa. And if we can avoid these threats, if we can find our way through them, we have about a billion years or, or 1.5 billion years before the sun is going to itself make this planet uninhabitable. So if we can just survive ourselves and, and the asteroids and comets, if we can do that much, then we have plenty of time to find the motivation, some other motivation to leave the planet. And, and that would be the way that I, I suggest doing it. And, and I'll just say one other thing on this topic, which is a cool topic. This is an area where we need to be thinking about other animals and other non-human sentient beings, because people are already thinking that one way we can, we can go to other planets is by terraforming them with non-human life. And we really need to think about the ethics of that. Once again, we really have to think about whether we expect this life to be net positive or net negative, whether the, the benefits are going to justify the cost, because in expectation, we, we will be causing a lot of suffering and death. And, and, and we need to think about that before we, before we go ahead and do it. And similar questions are going to arise with respect to artificial intelligences we might be bringing with us. So all, all very interesting questions, but that is my answer to the accelerationist argument that you made. So. I, I think that your answer has two problems. So the one is that if your characterization of the empirical possibilities and how they impact each other is correct, then you're just lucky. So it's, it's just lucky that it's the case that global warming is a threat multiplier rather than a, a spur to, to get off planet. So it, it seems like the story that you tell about how an increase in global climate change would, would make things worse is, is, is just one way it could go. And if it goes that way, then sure, it's, it's bad for us to, to accelerate climate change, but it seems to me that it could go the other way in which case, well, your outcome is going to be incorrect. The way I like to, to think about this is there's a, there's a whole range of existential ends that could occur to humanity, right? So you mentioned a lot of them, pandemics, nuclear war, meteor strike, etc., And a lot of those are not influenced by global warming. So one of them, for example, is a meteor strike. That, that comet is going to hit us with or without an extra degree or two in the atmosphere. It seems like there are certain uh, problems that could be made worse by climate change, but there are some that won't be. Um, you know, some madman pressing a button, I think today, we all feel it. Some madman pressing a button. He, he, it doesn't seem like he's more likely to press that button if he has to notch up his air conditioning by, by a reduction of one degree. It seems like he's just as likely to press that button. And what I would like in addition to that is a clock, is a countdown timer, right? I'd like, just, just as we have these scientists saying, well, we've got to get our act together because if we don't get our act together, then by this date, we're all doomed. That's exactly what I want. I want, I want a countdown timer. Because that countdown timer, what it does is it reduces all the risks of existential end to humanity after that time as relevant. And it says, we've got to get our act together before then. We don't have time to muck about. We don't have time to reduce our funding for NASA extraplanetary research, which is what we've been doing 
steadily over the last few decades. We don't, we don't have time for that. We don't have time to pump it into solar panels and, and into green research. Forget all of that. We've got to get off planet. We've got to get off planet soon. So, so first of all, I love that this is where the conversation is going <laughs> uh, to, to re respond to, to those points. So I agree that climate change is going to have mixed effects and produce winners and losers and, and going to cause some benefits and some harms. And I also agree that a consequentialist or a utilitarian of a, a roughly consequentialist variety needs to take all of those effects into account and needs to be open to surprising conclusions about the the aggregate value of, of global changes like climate change. And in fact, I discussed that in the book because I know that, for example, climate change will produce winners and losers in non-human populations. Some species will go extinct or diminish in numbers. Other species will come into existence or will expand in numbers. And if we want to know the net value of climate change for animals, we have to compare those those harms and benefits. How many animals will go down in numbers? How many will go up in numbers? of the ones that go down and up, how many have bad lives as opposed to good lives, and what are the probabilities and utilities. It could be there are fewer big animals like elephants, but more small animals like insects. Then we might face a, a kind of repugnant conclusion that a utilitarian would have to accept. And and I think all of that is worth taking seriously. And, and all else being equal, we should accept that if climate change produces more happiness than suffering in the aggregate in the short term, that climate change is good, not bad in the short term. But I still think the climate change is bad in the long run because of the way that it destabilizes our, our uh, social and political and economic systems and makes less likely the type of future you and I both hope can happen. And, and so I'm actually agnostic about whether climate change is net positive or net negative in the short to medium term. But, but I still think we should resist climate change because I think climate change is net negative in the long run because of this destabilizing effect and the way it feeds into other existential threats and makes it less likely we can uh, secure a positive, distant, long-term future. And, and just to say a little bit about why I do think it contributes to these other existential threats, the, the relationship is not the one that you were rejecting. The relationship is that in general, climate change is a threat multiplier. And so, so it introduces new threats, for example, by increasing the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like fires and floods, but, but then it also, and relatedly, will increase, amplify ordinary threats that, that humans and other animals are already dealing with, like hunger and thirst and illness and injury and, and so on. It makes those threats worse. When humans are dealing with, for example, a lack of access to housing and, and healthcare and, and food and these sorts of things, these major disruptions, they make that worse, as, as we know from COVID-19, as we know from fires and floods and so on. And so the relationship between climate change and these other existential threats is not that Russia is a few degrees warmer today than, than it would have been otherwise, and that makes Putin a, a little bit more irritable, and so he decides to press the button. I mean, that could happen, <laughs> but, but the actual relationship that I worry about is that the general destabilizing effects of climate change make it harder to recover from and rebuild from the event the eventuality of, of a nuclear uh, exchange or an asteroid or a comet. It, the, the effects are more devastating when coupled with the effects of climate change and rebuilding is harder and more uncertain. That's the effect that I worry about. So I want to try and talk about something cosmic and then bring us back down to earth. And there's this Douglas Adams book, uh, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe. Uh, and at the restaurant at the end of the universe, they meet the cow that wants to be eaten. And the cow is bred in this way to have the strong desire for death because it's sort of purpose is uh, wrought up in, in uh, being eaten by someone else. And you talked about, you know, if we're thinking about the nature of the being uh, and whether we should bring them into existence or whether we should kill them, whether we should preserve them, this might be a factor that plays a role, right? So should we be giving attention to the idea of creating beings that have a strong desire and in other words, the good would be amplified through us factory farming them. In other words, the more you put them in small cages, the more you chopped off their beaks, the more they loved it. Assume we could find a way to reverse the pleasure pain senses or something. So you've got the, the sadomasochistic chicks. So when they're put through the meat grinder, instead of feeling the anguish that they currently feel in our world, it's just the ecstasy of death. Is that something we should be considering? And then the other one is to, to bring ourselves into the world that we're in and thinking about whether we should be bringing certain animals into existence. 
So one of the views is that if we didn't have factory farming, these animals would never exist. They would, they would be, some of them would be brought to extinction uh, because there'd be no purpose for them if we weren't eating them. And funny enough, one of our prior guests, Travis Timmerman, we were talking about there's a, there's a way at the moment to, instead of having chicken sexes, so a chicken sexer will check a baby chick to see if it's male or female. If it's male, it gets put into a chute and ground up. And uh, there's a way to instead uh, sex select at an earlier uh, stage so that you never, um, there are no male chicks that are ever born, only female chicks. And so you would save the, the Holocaust of chickens. And Travis thought that there might be a problem with this. He thought that a failure to bring into existence those male chicks means that they miss out uh, on the positive utility they have. He thinks it would be much better not to grind them up to death. He's a vegan himself, but thinks that um, there's a problem with never bringing them into existence. So there's these sort of two cases. There's the one about genetically designing things to enjoy their suffering and their death. And the other one is about the non-existence. Yeah, this is the the kind of flip side, as as you know, of the issue about whether to exterminate wild animals who have net negative well welfare. And and so there are names for for these these arguments, which which you may know. One one is the logic of the larder. The logic of the larder is the idea that if farmed animals have uh, net positive welfare, then we actually owe it to them to eat them to so that we can bring into existence more such animals and and allow them to have net positive lives in the future. And then the logic of the logger is that if wild animals have net negative welfare, then we owe it to them to, to exterminate them and, and uh, drive them to extinction to bring about fewer such animals in the future. And you, you might be noticing a pattern in, in my answers to your questions, but in theory, I, I think, of course, we, we should be open to anything that in fact maximizes happiness and minimizes suffering from all, for all sentient beings from now until the end of time, even when it has surprising and counterintuitive Im implications. But in practice, I am extremely wary uh, of these kinds of arguments because I do think, first of all, this is empirically not likely to work out, especially in, in the genetic engineering case, it is much easier to genetically engineer uh, cultivated meat without, without having animals in the picture at all, much easier to do that than to ge genetically engineer animals who want nothing more in life than, than to be factory farmed. So, so I am empirically not confident this is a, a real possibility, but even if it is as an indirect, sophisticated, et cetera, utilitarian or consequentialist, again, I do think there is a lot of value from a utilitarian perspective in building systems of moral and legal and political rights and cultivating individually and collectively virtues of respect and compassion for vulnerable populations and cultivating caring relationships with vulnerable populations. And, and that all means refusing to treat them as objects, as property, as commodities, to, to breed them to have features that are useful for us rather than features that are useful for them and, and promote their own health and, and welfare. And, and so on and so forth. And, and so I think that that creates a presumption against the logics of the larder and of the logger. Now that is only a presumption in practice. I think the presumption is decisive in the farming case. We, we really have no reason to do this instead of, uh, developing plant-based alternatives in, in the wild animal suffering case. I think it remains to be seen whether that presumption is decisive. We just need to learn much more about wild animal welfare and then weigh those costs and benefits. But, but yeah, my, my general answer is in theory, yes, fine, consider it in practice. No, accept a presumption in favor of rights and justice and proceed from there. So where I step off the, this, this train track is when you say things like, I can see no reason why we should farm the way we do. That is too strong. It must be too strong because we do farm that way. So we clearly have reasons. Now you might argue those reasons are not as good as the countervailing reasons that you're offering. And there we can have a debate, we can have a discussion, but the majority of humanity disagrees with you. So there must be reasons why people farm. There must be reasons why people consume animals, even if, and even though this is more likely to produce enormous suffering, this is more likely to produce pandemics. This impacts climate change. All of those are negative impacts, but there must be some positive reasons why people farm animals. 
And the problem I have with arguments like these is they don't acknowledge those and they don't weigh them up. And so you, you simply lose the, the interest of the meat eater because the meat eater says, but, but hold on, you're giving me all these objections to eating meat and to farming animals in these ways, but I really like the taste of meat. And I, I really like, I really like the family get togethers that's that and the religious significance of meat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We had Mike, Mike Hume on our show and, and I, I really like Mike. Uh, we've had him on twice. Uh, he's an anarcho-capitalist and that is very much up my alley. I like a lot of what Mike has to say, but Mike made again, this incredibly bold claim, which I just find crazy, which is that it is absurd to think that there is any good reason to eat meat. And, and I, I think, well, well, that's absurd, right? They obviously are good reasons because people are doing it despite all of these arguments. So, so I, I, it seems to me like, yes, suppose I grant you everything you've said. Now we need to have a discussion about weighting those negative consequences with the positive consequences and there are some with eating meat. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I of course acknowledge that there are reasons in favor of all sorts of, all sorts of practices that on balance are horrific. And, and if I, if I said there is no reason whatsoever, that was a rhetorical flourish meant to indicate any reason in favor it is so dramatically outweighed by all of the reasons against that we might as well round down to zero for conversational purposes, <laughs> but, but absolutely, absolutely. There are reasons. I mean, the ideally coherent Caligula has reasons to do all the terrible things that he does. And by extension, ideally coherent versions of humans, well, they would not be ideally coherent, but in any case, yeah, we have reasons to do all the terrible things that we do, but of course the point of philosophy is to do the weighing as you suggest. And I think, I think the reasons against very dramatically outweigh the reasons in favor for humans with psychological profiles in the ballpark of ours. But that just seems too fast. That's just way too quick. It's just a bold assumption that no, no, it's a no, bold it's not assertion, an assumption right? at all. It, oh, so assertion. Just, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. So you're making this assertion that the reasons in favor of eating meat and farming animals are just vastly outweighed by the reasons against, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. By the way, my personal position is that I do think it's immoral to farm meat animals, but I eat them anyway, because I think there's countervailing reasons that aren't moral reason that Trump. So, so we can have the debate about the morality and there, I, I agree with you, although I don't think it's as morally abominable as you do, but I don't think morality is the last word on this. I think there's other issues at play, other values that matter. Yeah. So, so I guess answering that is difficult without going down a whole bunch of different avenues. Like now we have to talk about meta ethics and normative ethics and, and practical rationality and, and how these different domains of normativity all relate to each other. And then of course we have to have the actual substantive normative and applied discussions that inform how we, we weight these reasons. I mean, of course, to, to be clear, I, I was not merely asserting that, that this is bad. I, I was stating the conclusion of a book length argument <laughs> that, that I constructed for the conclusion that, that this is very, very bad and, and all of the reasons against outweigh the reasons in favor. But yes, for purposes of this conversation, I, I was kind of, uh, cutting to the end and, and making the assertion. My, my own view is, is that something like a constructivist theory of, of rationality is correct that, that our reasons are in some sense, a product of our beliefs and values and, and what we have most reason to do is a function of what we most deeply believe in value or would, if we were fully informed and ideally coherent. So, so uh, all I can do is kind of state what I think is true about meta ethics and normative ethics and, and how I think something like an individual set of reasons can nevertheless give way to something like utilitarianism, which then gives way to something like my conclusions that it in fact is absolutely the case that the reasons against farming animals at scale industrially, the reasons against that outweigh the reasons in favor of eating factory farms meat. So 
One of the arguments that's raised against individual vegetarians or vegans is that it's unlikely that their individual choices will have any positive net utility. And so a response is to say, well, maybe that's the case. Maybe it's the case that the same number of cows will be killed regardless of whether I eat meat or not. But it's not a matter of individual choices. It's a matter of collective action. So if you were able to rewrite our law to maximize the good for the sake of humanity and for the sake of the animals, what are the legal changes that you would make? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for putting the question that way. I actually do think individual action matters, not only individual participation in boycotts, but also individual participation in protests and elections and other collective political actions. And in that respect, boycotts are relevantly similar to other political actions. And my participation in boycotts is relevantly similar to my participation in other political actions. And I do think we spend a little bit too much time talking about the ethics of what we eat and not enough time talking about other sorts of actions in which we can participate. And, and so in this book, I do focus on legal and political changes, general structural changes that we can be pursuing. And, and so some examples include, uh, we can, we can be pursuing informational policies. We can be informing the public about animal welfare and about global health and environmental uh, and other impacts of food systems so they can make more informed choices. So informational policies, financial policies, we can be reducing subsidies for harmful food systems, increasing subsidies for helpful food systems. We can be imposing full cost pricing so that industries are required to pay for the, the public health and environmental harms that they cause, which of course will drive prices up for harmful industries. We can be pursuing regulations where companies and industries are expected to maintain a minimum set of standards for how they treat workers and, and animals and again, public health and the environment that again will drive prices up. And of course, when the time is right, we can pursue bans. And, and I think we ought to pursue bans of, of especially violent and harmful uh, practices like, like factory farming. So, so I advocate for something like uh, a combination of informational and financial and regulatory changes that build momentum, lay the groundwork for bans, which once we get alternatives up and running through subsidies and other forms of research and development and, and have just transition programs so that workers and consumers can, can access food and, and jobs and these other sectors at that point, I think bans will be appropriate. And then of course that all is with respect to food. There are all sorts of other things we can do more generally in terms of supporting research and, and advocacy around uh, animal welfare and in particular wild and aquatic and invertebrate animal welfare, including animals and impact assessments that inform policy decisions. And then uh, armed with those impact assessments, considering animal welfare when we make new education policy, learning better stuff about animals, employment policy, training people to care for animals rather than hurt social services, more veterinarians and veterinary services and infrastructure. When we build the cities of the future, we can be installing wildlife corridors on, on new green rail systems and burn friendly glass on, on new vehicles and, and buildings in all of these ways and more we can be building, including animal welfare in, in our various legal and political actions. And then finally, we also have to consider the foundations of our legal and political systems, like what kind of legal and political status and representation animals have and how, for example, liberal democratic capitalist systems or alternatives might look different if animals are included as subjects rather than objects. So those sound like very reasonable policies. What I'm curious about is why you're not driven to far more radical policies. So one of our guests on, on our show, Stephen Kirshner, he presents the following objection to the pro-life position on abortion. So he says, if pro-life is correct, then you are killing a human being when you, you're committing murder, when you abort. Suppose that you see there's an abortion doctor, um, walking to work. Don't you have a moral obligation if there's no other way to get, to stop him from getting to work, to put a bullet in his head, because you can, you can kill one to save all of these fetuses that he's going to abort over time. Uh, it's similar to the Nazi concentration camp SS Gestapo worker, right? So he, he's going to press the button on the gas chamber and you stop him from doing so. The only way you can do it is by killing him. It seems like you've done a good thing and you are obligated to do so. It seems like if you're going to ascribe su such value to animals, you have a, a similar, a similar objection raised is that under certain circumstances, it seems like it would be permissible and maybe obligatory to go and kill animal farmers. 
Well, that that is absolutely a, a provocative suggestion. I uh, have a chapter about that in, in my previous book, uh, co-authored book, Food, Animals, and the Environment, a chapter about the ethics of illegal animal and environmental activism. And in that chapter, I cover everything from paradigmatic cases of civil disobedience and then other forms of direct action and then property destruction and then violence and then terrorism. And in each case, consider both conceptually what this means and then normatively what the ethics of it are and and mostly try to make the, a, a couple of points. One, that the conceptual and normative questions are related to each other. And it tends to be the case that the more narrowly we define terms like violence and, and terrorism, the wronger <laughs> violence and terrorism are, but then the less what animal and environmental activists do is that. Whereas the more expansively, the more broadly we define violence and terrorism, the, the more there can be instances of it that might not be wrong. And, and, and then the more that actually does describe what, what some animal and environmental activists do. And in general, I, I just try to make the case that we should not get sucked into people's attempts to label or frame animal and environmental activism as militant, as violent, as extremist, as terrorist, because in fact, animal and environmental activists are among the very most peaceful and nonviolent activists in the planet. And it's only because of, of how radical their political visions are that they're often framed as, as violent and, and terrorists. And so, so when I discuss these issues, I just try to focus on, on these points that, that animal and environmental activists are in fact nonviolent. People frame them as violent anyway. We should maintain a nonviolent stance for strategic reasons, if nothing else. And, and we should resist the temptation to only engage in forms of activism that are framed as nonviolent, because that is just the political opposition boxing you in to an incredibly moderate and reformist set of interventions. You should be willing to do some things that are in fact nonviolent, but that get labeled violent by, by your, your opponents in an attempt to frame you as extremists. But when it comes to, to your question, look again, in theory. If I can kill one to save five, all else being equal, yes, I will kill one to save five, right? In practice, got to consider all of the indirect effects. You got to consider uh, social and legal and political and economic repercussions. You got to consider the fact that even if this person stops killing animals, someone else might just start killing more animals to take their place and, and so on and so forth. And, and those are among the reasons why I think just strategically and politically, it actually does make sense even for a utilitarian to draw a line in the sand and to say, look, maybe illegal direct action can be okay. Open rescues can be okay. Maybe even some limited forms of property destruction can be okay in activism and advocacy, but we really should draw a line at violence and terrorism and just not be in the business, universally not be in the business of, of engaging in violence and terrorism.